What's up, guys? Welcome back to Social Distancing. I'm your boy, Riley Taylor, and I'm here with my friend Isabel Lyons, mm -hmm. who is a school teacher in the area. What grade do you teach? Third grade. Third grade? Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's my favorite grade because of the content that I get to teach. What about the kids you get to teach? Also one of the best ages. Really? Still love their teachers, but very independent and capable. What is it? that teachers mean when they say, I love this age? It means... <laughs> what does that mean? That when they say, <laughs> I love this age, it's like the developmental like age, like the things that they're going through, the things that they're interested in. It's like you as a teacher, like, ugh. Like kindergartners, right? Like kindergartners. Mm -hmm. It's their first time doing everything. Me as a teacher, I'm like, please no. Like, I don't want to be a part of that. But some kindergarten teachers, like, I love that I'm the first one that gets right. to be a part of this. So that's kind of my funny. kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Holly Pankratz, mm. friend requested me on Facebook mm. a year ago. Mm -hmm. And it was because she wow. was at a fundraiser with a, a friend of mine who comes here to the church met talked oh my goodness riley taylor i had him in kindergarten what a great oh, whoa. teacher so she friend requested me and i i i went to her profile i was searching through Ms. prankratz if you're listening <laughs> um thanks for all you do um so i was looking at her pictures and i was like i don't remember this person like this in my kindergarten mind she had <laughs> this like she's this adult you know, she's like, she, you know, was huge. She was yeah, 10 yeah, feet yeah, yeah, tall. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So then seeing her as a 30 year old, I was like, oh, she's just this like Wait, person. She was, oh, she's only 30. No, now. I, I was. 30. Oh, okay. I, was 30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. I don't know how old she is. Huh. I, I didn't ask either. That's a good teacher that she remembers. I mean, because she had so many kindergartners and that she would remember your name. That's I must be incredible. memorable. <laughs> <laughs> good thing bad thing <laughs> yes so t speaking of teaching and right now your school mm -hmm. over in Bothell mm -hmm. is not operating or not meeting it's complicated it's, it's really complicated. complicated the school campus is closed down and the amount of resources and support that we are allowed to give our families is limited like okay. you've probably heard that like some schools are like what they're calling online learning you know where the kids are at home with the computers some schools like that would be shoreline maybe like yeah i think because they all have ipads all those right kids. exactly some of the private schools are doing online learning some districts are still figuring it out my district was doing full-blown online learning and then had to shut it down Whoa. because Basically, what happened is that if you're going to give education, it needs to be equitable to all parties involved in your school, of course, which is because it's sort thing. of the point of education. Exactly. If not everybody can access it, then technically it's against the law because all students have the right to education. And so they were concerned about um, students who are English language learners and special needs students being able to access their services online, which is what kind of shut down our district's online learning which is okay here's my my question right out of the gate when i heard when i hear about this is i go well other districts are doing it so talking about equity yes you might be you might have jurisdiction to mandate equity within one district but there's other districts so that's equity yeah. too yeah so i, I don't know how it's do how really, do they come to these decisions it's a really interesting time that we're in because everything is what they've been calling uncharted waters really right because we've never been in a situation like this the state has no plan for if a pandemic hits Whoa. what we do with there's there was not a plan i feel like there should place. have been some plan right um, maybe just a page <laughs> Maybe just a page we could all go to. Lifehack.com. Yeah. Right. So Here's what to do. Regulations, guidelines have been coming out week to week, which is what has kind of made it, I think, maybe confusing for parents and even me as a teacher, you know, where you're getting these mandates from school district and the state saying you can do this, you can't do this, and wondering where it's all coming from. Right. But understanding also that our government – is making decisions as they go, you know? And kind of the first decision that they had to make was making sure that students were being fed, 
that's what they had to handle first. Students were being taken care of because some families, you know, they don't have the capacity to watch their kids at home, you know, right. healthcare workers, grocery store workers, you know, they can't be at home with their kids. So where, where's the child care in that? And so this is, I mean, for these people, for these district workers and all that, they're not just thinking education. They're thinking no. overall well-being. Right, which is another misconception of education in times like this, that education only teaches, but that education really is a resource for families that they rely on for meals, um, for child care so that they can make money. So the education system is much more than teaching your kids math and other subjects. It's really a kind of a social fabric thing. This is a real key pillar of our the way we've built our society, like this is right there at the center. Yeah, of it. and along with student and family mental health, there's a lot of resources, right. counseling, yeah. and just, you know, the smo- like the social emotional pieces. There's a lot of concern for students who are in unstable home environments, who are not being supervised right now. Like what is their mental health and how are they wow. doing too? So it's a lot. Right. So, so your, I guess, industry, I don't know what else to call it, department that you're in. Institution. Yeah, your institution, Mm -hmm. the educational institution, really deals with the great spectrum of diverse family backgrounds and situations, trying to be equitable in the way that we handle it so that we're not leaving people behind or kind of, because the whole idea of public education conceptually was equity in the sense of, Uh, education is a path towards freedom and in a democracy, a liber uh, society like our own, that's free. It's really a building block of the idea that it's a human right to have education. Right. So it's so much more. That's why I think sometimes families like we can feel frustrated with whatever your school situation is. If it's shut down right now, if you're not getting the online learning that you think you should be getting in your district, it's really easy to get frustrated. Yeah. But when you look at the bigger picture and see what the state is trying to do, it it's easier to give some grace and to see how they're trying to make it a level playing field. But it, it. also points out um, the inequities that are inherently in education, that some school districts don't have, you know, all of these electronic devices to be given out. Hmm. Well, like, why is that if everybody should like be Like Shoreline has exactly. a tax base, uh-huh. which, which funds a lot more technological right. innovation yeah so i really north think shore another it's, one it's bringing to the surface like why are some districts able to do this and other districts not able to do this and a big thing that's been going around is making sure that students aren't being served like according to their zip code so because you live in this area and you go to the school district you don't get to have the same opportunities as other districts because mm-hmm. think about it the crazy thing to me that i've always known about public education is that technically everyone should be getting the same education. Right, technically. Yeah. Technically, but they're not. But they're not. Right? So that totally depends on the district. People move houses. I mean, and not just education, but opportunities in certain subjects. Mm-hmm. More like this school's got this great teacher. Totally. You know, or great sports program. Like my sister, for example, mm-hmm. we moved to Shoreline from Seattle district so that she could go to that school because that would provide those opportunities for so our whole family moved for yeah. this yeah, yeah 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 and she did she got a full ride scholarship to right. university of oregon because of that move and right. it's interesting because it's, it's all it, you can kind of game it in mm-hmm. a way you know if you're able yeah and you may not have seen these differences but when a pandemic arises yeah you see and it then you start to see it a lot more. I think that that has been a kind of recurring theme is that the moment we're in with this pandemic has revealed mm-hmm. a lot mm-hmm. and not just at the bigger institutional level, but at the individual level, mm-hmm. like what are my priorities? I sure do see them mm-hmm. when I don't have to get up and go to work mm-hmm. and I'm at home all day. Mm-hmm. What do I what do what do I think about more? What am I scared of? Mm-hmm. How do I actually feel about my children? You know, yeah, yeah, these yeah. things are being revealed. Mm-hmm. So here's a question for maybe people who are 
curious or let's say confused and frustrated by this whole school system, how can you uh, just explain to them what's really going on? Why are their kids not able to participate? Participate. Why are things the way they are? Right. I mean, it's so many variables to it, but I think the big key thing here is that districts can't do online learning. They can't put that into place unless they are able to assure and follow regulations that show that um, their English language learning students and their special needs students um, are able to access that as well. The reason why those two groups are talked about a lot right now is because if you're learning English like as a parent or like maybe the student is the only one in the household who speaks English and the only way to set up online learning at home is by receiving all these emails from the school that are all in English, right? It's like, how are they going to set, like, you know, setting up hotspots at home, you know? Or like, you know, different families' uh, experiences with technology. Like, we can't Mm -hmm. assume that everybody, like, knows how to access, like, Google Classroom. It sort of brings up one of the debates that's also going on more generally is this issue about the internet being a utility, Mm -hmm. and being a necessity like water (laughs) Uh, just simply because that's just how it is right and so if we don't and this is what like a lot of companies that provide internet are actually afraid of because then they'd lose their business Mm. when you know when they have to then be regulated as a utility they don't want that Um, Mm -hmm. but the question is well in a moment like this when so much disparity is revealed all of a sudden Mm -hmm. and everything has to shut down in weird, staggered ways, it sort of reveals a weak point. Yeah, totally. Yeah. How can followers of Jesus maybe, uh, I don't know, respond or think about these issues? How have you been handling it as a teacher? Yeah, I think that it's moments like these where... um, when like, you know, things are being sent down by the the state government and by districts is like you really, um, it really matters that you know your community best and that you are plugged in with your community and you know your community's needs. There's been like, I've been so touched by like our school and how much like families have been checking in with each other. Yeah. Like, do you need help setting up like your computer? Like, do you need access to a food bank? And I think just us as Christians, like being um, active community members right. and like not taking for granted um, the things that we have and knowing that like there are people who do not have that that could be living right next door to you. Um, and I think that that has been the most touching thing is just people going out of their ways, going out of the limits of their families to make sure other people in our school are doing okay with food, with child care, with, um, with computer issues, you know, like as teachers, like I'm doing those things, but I don't know your neighbor and I don't know the people who are around you and the state doesn't either. And like advocating for things that you're not seeing that need to be done because there's resources out there, but people don't get those resources unless someone says, Hey, did you know that there are these people who Hmm. need these things? And so I think really being a community advocate, I'm thinking back to like Jeremiah, where there's a passage that talks about like prospering the land, you know, being people who want this land to prosper and being involved in it. And I think that that's kind of weird because you're thinking about quarantine and you're like, Oh, but I should keep to myself. Like to me, quarantine doesn't mean keep to myself like I can still reach out via text phone call slipping a note under someone's door you know making sure that like I want the people around me to prosper where I live locally 